and we're good to go. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, Woman Jaka, welcome to the second of uh, Darabin's Jobs Forums, uh, Breaking the Barriers, a forum on employment for people living with disability. My name is Philip O'Brien. I'm part of the Economic Recovery and Resilience Team at Darabin City Council. We'll shortly be crossing to Wurundjeri Elder, Uncle Tony Garvey, for our official welcome to country. But I just quickly wanted to make mention of the fact that this event is being recorded this morning. And I wanted to acknowledge, as you can see on screen, our Auslan, interpret our Auslan interpreters, Therese and Chelsea, who will be on screen all morning this morning. Also briefly wanted to let you know that we've got some polls running, um, some live polls. Um, the first of which is now up and running and on your screen, you should be able to see this. Uh, this is just a way of uh, getting us, getting everyone to, to know each other um, and interact with each other uh, while we're in the Zoom room this morning. Um, so before we get anything else happening, let's get us underway. It's my pleasure to introduce Uncle Tony Garvey, who will be delivering our welcome to country. So it's over to you, Uncle Tony. Are you there, Uncle Tony? Just turn on your, there you go. No, I'm here, mate. Sorry about that. No um, first of all, uh, thanks, Philip, for your warm welcome. And um, also, I'd just like to say I'm very proud and honoured to be here represent my people, the uh, Wurrung, Wurundjeri people. So the uh, Wurundjeri people are also part of the Kulin Nation. So Kulin means men. In the Kulin Nation, there were five language groups. There was the Wadarong to the west, the Kurong, who were the Wesley neighbours to the Wadarong, Tanarong to the northeast, Butarong to the southwest, and the Wurrung of the Wurundjeri territory that we stand on here today. Wurundjeri lies within the cities of Melbourne. It extends from the mountains of the Great Dividing Range, south to the Yarra River, west to the Werribee River, and east to Mount Borbore. The Wurundjeri people, they have a social totem. It is Bunjil the Eagle. Bunjil represents spiritual power throughout many parts of Australia. Bunjil taught all the laws about life, behaviour and ceremonies to make sure that our culture would continue for all walks of life throughout Australia. Bunjil is referred to as the creator of mankind. Bunjil created great people from the land and that is why we call the land our mother or the mother of creation. Never can the land be taken away. The land will always belong to Aboriginal people as we are part of the land and the land is part of us. Our story is similar to yours. Yours is by your chosen faith, ours is by the dream time. We both have creators and beliefs and ours is Bunjil. It is a traditional custom of the Australian Aboriginal communities to be asked and to give permission for people to enter their land. And today you have now joined with me to honour the spirits of my ancestors, past, present and emerging, who have nurtured this land for over 60,000 years. And we as the custodians of the land offer our heartly welcome to the land and hope that together as citizens of this beautiful country, we can build, develop and unite stronger nation for all people. And finally, I'd just like to close in my Wurrung language, which is Wimijika, Wandun, Wurundjeri, Balak, Yemen, Kumibik, which means you're most welcome to the land of the Wurundjeri people. Thank you very much for having me here today. I'd like to hand you over now to Justin from Economics, Recovery and Resilience. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. Thanks so much, Uncle Tony, and thank you for a wonderful, warm welcome to country. It's a privilege to have you here this morning and a privilege to be joining you from Wondery, Wurrung land myself. Um, my name is Justin Henrahan. I'm Manager Economic Recovery and Resilience at the City of Darabin, and I'd like to, on behalf of the City of Darabin, welcome you all here to this session this morning. I'd also like to acknowledge that the Wurundjeri Roarong people as traditional custod owners of the land um, that I'm joining from this morning in Abbotsford, but also the land that encompasses the city of Darabin. And I'd like to recognise their continu continuing connection to land, water and culture, pay my respects to elders past, present and emergent, 
and acknowledge that sovereignty has never been ceded. Morning, and again, welcome to the second of a series of jobs forums designed to assist in help getting Darabin back to work. Each of these forums will shine a light on the challenges and opportunities that exist in the employment of disadvantaged and marginalised groups. In July, we presented a forum that highlighted employment for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and those from newly arrived multicultural backgrounds. A recording of this forum is available on request. Today, our forum will focus on employment for people with disability. To set the scene, what we know is that over the last 20 months, unemployment in Darabin has increased by more than 50%. Darabin found itself reporting the second highest unemployment level of any local government agency in inner Metro Melbourne. And the particular groups were harder hit than most. For example, job seeker caseload numbers doubled for the cold community and for young people under the age of 25. We also know that people with disability have long been underrepresented in labour force participation, with numbers consistently hovering around 53% compared to 84% for those without disability. Indications are that this situation also worsened as a result of the impacts of COVID. Nationally, the percentage of participants registered with NDIS in a paid job decreased by around 6% between March and December of 2020. Locally, caseload numbers of those accessing disability employment services in Darabin appear to have risen by several hundred, from 1,900 to around 2,200 in the year from 2019, December 2019 to December 2020. This is significant given that according to recent figures, 21% of Darabin residents identify as living with disability. The challenges around employment are therefore complex and in recognition of this complexity, there's been a whole of government response. We now have the Local Jobs Coordinator Program, which brings together expertise, resources and funding to focus on creating employment opportunities, meeting local employer demands and better skilling local job seekers. Darabin is serviced re regionally by two local jobs pro program coordinators. There's also Jobs Victoria, which incorporates the Jobs Victoria Employment Service or JVES programs. The JVES program service cover Darabin and also Darabin Council has identified the challenge and is meeting it head on. In the 2021 to 2025 council plan, the city of Darabin has committed to stimulating local solutions and catalyzing new jobs at scale, including those for people who face multiple employment barriers. This led us to forming partnerships and agreements so that we could deliver services directly, including the jobs advocates who will support and mentor job seekers, particularly those in highly disadvantaged categories to build their capacity to re-enter the workforce. The Darabin-based JVs program created through a partnership with Brotherhood of St Lawrence is allowing us to tap into resources that support local employers as well as job seekers. Darabin has also been working to identify, connect and bring together a broad range of services and supports that now exist to complement the service delivery of these programs. These include the job active providers, skills and job centres, group training organisations, and of course, disability employment service providers. It's worth noting that Darabin hosts some 14 disability, and serv disability service employment service providers, as well as other unique programs and services supporting training and employment for people with living with disability in our community. So the support infrastructure is in place in Darabin, and all of it is designed to turn the numbers around. But this can only be effective if we all work together. That's where you come in. Today, we'll be hearing from an amazing group of speakers, some of whom will speak from their lived experience of disability and navigating the employment scene, while others will talk about the ways in which employers can come, become more accessible and open to employment of people living with disability. Then we'll be inviting, encouraging you to reflect participate and ask questions, but most of all to connect and share. In that spirit, we can all play a part in getting Darabin back to work. 
Thanks again for joining us this morning. I'm sure that you'll get a great amount of benefit out of this morning's session. And I will now hand back to Philip to talk us through what we'll, you'll be experiencing this morning with us. Thank you so much, Justin Hanrahan, uh, Manager Economic Recovery and Resilience for the City of Darabin. And I'd also like to thank um, Uncle Tony Garvey from before that for our wonderful welcome to country. Um, that was, it's always beautiful to hear those words. Um, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the lands on which we're all meeting. Um, for me, that is the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung. Um, I'm dialing in from beautiful Eltham up here. Um, and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and particularly to any um, Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who may be joining us this morning. I'd also like to invite um, all of you um, to use the chat function on the, uh, the Zoom uh, chat and put in um, what uh, uh, Aboriginal country you're calling in from, if you so wish to. Um, so let me just say that this is the second of, of uh, Darabin's Jobs Forums, um, and this one is focused on employment for people with disability. We'll shortly be getting into the full scale discussion of that topic. Uh, but first of all, we just need to do some housekeeping. There's lots of moving parts to this morning's presentation, uh, and I'll just run you through a few of those. Um, as you can see on screen, we have our Auslan interpreters. Hello again to Therese and Chelsea. Um, we've also got um, some other things happening for accessibility. Uh, on the, um, the toolbar at the bottom of your screen, if you hover your mouse over the bottom of your Zoom screen, um, you'll see an icon to the right uh, with the letters CC. Uh, if you click on that, you actually get a live transcript. Uh, so you get closed captions of what's being said appearing on your screen. Um, you can turn that on and off as you so desire. It's entirely controlled by you. I also mentioned to you that we've got live polling. Uh, this will be going throughout the session uh, to encourage people to um, converse and get to know each other. And in the spirit of that, I can tell you that um, by ending the poll that we've just done, uh, most people here are really looking forward to catching up with friends and family, probably after a long break. Um, I think that's something I'd be keen to do, go and visit my sister down in Terralgan. Um, and uh, there's obviously lots of others looking forward to getting out and about, which you'll be able to do a bit more of uh, from this weekend. I'm really looking forward to getting my hair cut, as you can see. Um, so the second of our polls will just um, launch as well uh, while we're going on with this. And the second of our polls will just also help us to get a better idea um, of who else uh, is joining us this morning. But if you would prefer uh, with that, you are quite welcome to put into the chat function uh, your contact details, which will help us all to better engage with each other and we can maybe network with each other off screen. Um, so getting back to the, to the, uh, the Zoom toolbar at the bottom here, um, I've mentioned the chat function. So we're gonna be using the chat function and the Q and A functions this morning. What we'll ask you to use the chat for uh, is for those things um, such as I can see appearing in the chat function now, just letting people know who you are, uh, letting people know what traditional lands you're on. Um, so that would be what you'd use the chat function for. For the Q and A function, um, something quite different. Uh, so we have a panel of speakers, which we'll be introducing to you shortly, and no doubt you'll have questions for them and for others. Please put those questions in the Q&A function. It's easier for us to moderate. Um, if you do put it in the other, we can move it across, um, but it's just easier so that we know where all the questions are coming in from. So what's gonna happen this morning? Very shortly, we'll throw to Serap Sweeter of Job, Job Access. Um, who will talk about making workplaces more accessible for people with disability. And then we'll move on to hearing from our panel members who will speak from their personal lived experience about the challenges they faced in gaining and retaining employment, uh, but also about the contributions they make to the teams that they work with. And following this, we'll have two very special guests who will give the employer perspective and the government program response. And then finally, and let's hope we get time for this because this is going to be so important for all of us. Throw the door open to all of you to participate. 
Um, I can see from the poll results that we're coming up on the screen at the moment uh, that we have a real mixture of different types of people uh, from different um, organizations, um, plenty from the service provider angle, um, some others, um, and maybe if you can just put in the chat function, the others, I'll try to monitor it all. So we've got someone here from Global Sisters, which is a magnificent organization supporting um, people um, who are looking to start their own business. Um, we've got he, uh, Bo's here from Melbourne Polytechnic. Good morning, Bo. Um, and we have others who are from other organizations as well. And the Bremer, I can see there, who's a jobs advocate. Um, so we'll just end that poll uh, and you can see for yourself who else is in the room there. Um, so where do we go from here? Well, we're going to throw now to uh, Serap Sweda, uh, who is a professional advisor for Job Access's National Disability Recruitment Program. What's Job Access? Job Access was created by the Australian government to bring together the information and resources that can drive disability employment. Serap will firstly set some context around uh, what we're here to talk about this morning, and then she'll take you through what Job Access has to offer. Good morning, and over to you, Sarah. Good morning, thank you, Phil. I'd like to firstly acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where I am located today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I would also like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Today, I'm going to give you an overview of job access and the services that we provide to help remove the barriers to employment for people with a disability followed by some information around workplace adjustments and how employers can access supports to make their workplaces more accessible. I'll just share my screen now. I assume everyone can see that screen nice and clearly. Okay. So job access is made up of a predominantly a five-pronged service. Uh, it's delivered by Work Focus Australia on behalf of the Australian government, and we're a national hub for workplace employment information for people with a disability, for employers, and also for service providers. Um, and we, we serve to help remove those barriers to employment for people with a disability. Those uh, five services that we provide up on your screen here um, is, is what makes us up. So we provide uh, expert advice via our phone line, we also have a comprehensive website available um, for, for anyone who wants information around disability recruitment. So again, that's employers, service providers and uh, people with a disability. We coordinate the workplace adjustments and modification service through the Employment Assistant Fund. Uh, we have the Employer Engagement Service or the National Disability Recruitment Coordinator. Um, and that's the team that I'm from actually, we work with the larger, uh, any employer actually to help build their disability competence and confidence. We have the Complaints Resolution and Referral Service, which aims to improve government-funded disability support services through a fair and impartial complaints resolution process. And we have the National Disability and Abuse Neckline, uh, Hotline, sorry, uh, which is a vital reporting service available for anyone who suspects the abuse or neglect of a person with a disability. Now, going back to a couple of those services, one of them is the Employer Engagement Team and the NDRC, or National Disability Recruitment Coordinator. We work with any employers of any size to help build their disability confidence. But one of the main services that we provide is the delivery of a 12 month partnership. And that's uh, with larger employers, so they need to have at least 100 employees. And the partnership is a free non-binding partnership and it's made up of four core activities. We give the employer a recruitment review through the lens of a person with a disability. So we'll come through their recruitment processes from the initial advertising of the vacancy stage all the way through to the onboarding and employment stage of the vacancy. And we'll make recommendations and suggestions on some inclusive practices um, that, that the employer can implement. Uh, followed by the recruitment review, we deliver a disability awareness information session, which gives the employers a, a, uh, a general overview on disability. So we'll cover key topics like uh, we'll go through the legalities, we'll go through stereotypes and discrimination that people with a disability might experience during their uh, recruitment efforts, um, sorry, during their uh, employment seeking efforts. We'll cover um, reasonable adjustments, mental health. They're some of the key kind of topics that we cover. There's a whole lot more there. 
Uh, followed by the information session, we do what we call the train the trainer, which is basically a handover of all the resources we use to deliver that training session. There's no intellectual property issues with anything that we share with our employers, any resources, tips, tools, whatever it might be. It's, it's uh, We're more than happy to um, share our knowledge there. The uh, final core activity in that partnership is a DES information session. And that's the opportunity for the employers and the DES to connect and build a relationship with each other, get a good understanding of, of, of their processes um, and, and hopefully they can, they can work together going forward. One of the most important ways that businesses can remove the barriers to employment and create more accessible and inclusive workplaces is through workplace adjustments. Workplace adjustments are any changes that will enable a person with a disability to have equitable employment opportunities and work effectively, comfortably and to their full capacity in their roles. Employers can make these uh, any kind of adjustments in the physical environment, in the workplace practices or policies to help improve accessibility and inclusion. I'm going to share some statistics with you now. One in five Australians live with a disability, and this number is, is increasing with the ageing population. More than 2.4 million Australians have a mental or physical health condition. Over 2 million Australians of working age, so that's between the ages of 15 and 64, or have a disability. Some might, some might be born with that disability or might have acquired it through age or, or by an accident. Most disabilities are invisible. In fact, 90% of them are invisible. And those would be your mental health um, disabilities like anxiety and depression. In fact, depression is the leading cause of disability worldwide. Anxiety and depression and any other disabilities can have a, a minimal or, or a, a substantial impact on someone's capacity to work. 31% of the population, so that's you know, three in 10 people will have some sort of uh, have an accessibility requirement. How can we at Job Access help facilitate workplace adjustments? Well, we do we do it through our expert and confidential phone line. So that's that 1800 464 800 number that you see on your screen there, where you could uh, speak to some of our frontline professionals on the phone. And we also coordinate the National Panel of Assessors to conduct free independent workplace assessments to help work out any adjustments or equipment that uh, would meet an employee's needs to help them do their best in their job. These adjustments are eligible for reimbursements through the Employment Assistant Fund and job access is, help, is, is available to help guide you through that process. The EAF is available to, or the Employment Assistant Fund, I should say, is available to people with a disability who are either about to start a job or who are currently in, in employment and require some work-related modifications and, and services. Some of the modifications and services might be um, a modification to work vehicles, information communication devices, Auslan interpreting, um, some awareness training on disability and deafness, for example, and even mental health first aid. Our research at Job Access is showing that 90% of modifications through the EAF cost less than $10,000, 5%, sorry, 50% cost less than $1,000. And a lot of the adjustments cost nothing at all. And, and that could be like providing flexible work hours or uh, working from home adjustments, which we're very much accustomed to now in, in Melbourne in particular. That brings me to the end of my brief presentation. Thank you for listening. I strongly encourage you to speak to um, you know, any uh, of our professionals advisors on the 1-800 number or visit our website if you have any questions relating to um, what, what um, I've covered today, but I know we're gonna have a Q&A later as well. Thank you. And thank you so much, um, Sarah. Um, yes, look, indeed, if you have questions for Sarah, uh, please save those up. You can put those in the Q&A right now. Um, but we will be getting to questions after our panel presentation. Um, I'm sure there was lots of food for thought in what Sarah just went through. The one that always strikes me is the, um, uh, the fact that most disabilities in the workplace are invisible. Um, and this is something that uh, I think the, the employers in the room, um, it, it's worth uh, thinking about. Um, that uh, you are probably working and no doubt working with people uh, who have a lived experience with disability uh, and you just can't see it, um, but it's there. 
Uh, so I, that's something we can probably address a bit later on with the, the range of guests and the range of people that we have um, joining us in the, um, in the conversation room this morning. So this brings me to the part of the morning I've been looking forward to the most. Uh, four people are about to join us and they will be talking about their own experiences. This will be a facilitated discussion and there will be time for your questions immediately after. And Serap will be joining us again after the, um, this Q&A, sorry, this um, presentation as well uh, to take your questions. So your facilitator for this section is my colleague, Jade Mykonos, the Arabin City Council's Community Development Officer, whose work focuses on increasing economic participation for people with a disability in Darabin. So I'd like to introduce you now to Jade, and she will in turn introduce the panel. Over to you, Jade. Thank you, Phil. Hi, everybody. My name is Jade Mikanos. My pronouns are she and her. I am privileged to be attending today's event from the lands of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nation. Uncle Tony, if you're still out there, thank you for welcoming us to this beautiful country that has been cared for by Aboriginal people for around 60,000 years. I feel very grateful to be living and working on this land. And I'd also like to extend my respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander attendees we have with us today. So today we have some incredible panelists who will share their lived and professional experience with us. We also acknowledge that this forum will not capture every experience of disability and employment. So please use the chat and use the questions if you feel like there is a particular perspective that you would like to bring or share into the discussion today. Adding to that, if a panelist says something that you would like to hear more about, please also put that in the Q&A and we can pick it up after the panel as well. Now, I would like to introduce the panel to you. First up, we have Sue Rock. Sue, would you like to turn your camera on? It's like the big reveal. Sue is the Executive Director of Arts Project Australia, which is a social enterprise that supports artists with intellectual disabilities, promotes their work and advocates for their inclusion in contemporary arts practice. Welcome, Sue. Next, we have Tamsin Jowett. Tamsin, would you like to turn your camera on? Tamsin is the president of Asperger's Victoria, which delivers employment supports led by people with lived experience to empower autistic job seekers, their employers and supporters. Welcome, Tamsin. Following Tamsin, we have Vicky Vato. Vicky, would you like to turn your camera on? Vicky has lived experience of disability and has followed a unique career path into local government. Vicky brings a unique perspective of the challenges and opportunities faced by people with disability from culturally diverse backgrounds when seeking and thriving in employment. Welcome, Vicky. And finally, we have Tom Quine. Tom, is your camera on as well? Thank you. Tom is a university graduate. He struggled for several years to get a job and after being diagnosed with autism, eventually got his break by the RISE program, which is an initiative designed to help people on the autism spectrum find work at the Department of Health. Tom has since progressed from his initial position in the records management unit to a role in communicable disease. Welcome, Tom. Now I'm, I'm gonna ask the panelists two questions each. The first will focus on challenges and the second will focus on solutions. So our first question is for you, Sue. Sue, could you tell us what are some of the challenges that art <coughs> project artists face when seeking to exhibit and sell their work in the mainstream market? Thank you, Jade, and, and hello, everybody. Um, interestingly enough, the Artists at Arts Project Australia face the same challenges that artists face, whether or not um, they have a disability. Uh, they're universal for artists. They're um, around uh, the opportunities to network with galleries, the opportunities to develop and write their own CV, the opportunity to create collaborative um, opportunities, get exhibitions and sell their own work. And if you're a whiz in all those areas, you can create your own website, you can do many, many things. But if your disability prevents you from um, uh, perhaps writing or you have various communication needs that aren't met, this can be very difficult. So what we do as an organisation, I suppose, is assist in those, completing grant applications, protecting um, from corrupt art buyers who might recognise an opportunity for commercial exploitation, and accessing opportunities in the broader contemporary art sector generally. Thank you, Sue. 
I hope you're all jotting your comments down or questions in the audience if you have them for after two. Now I'd like to invite Tamsin to answer the next question. Tamsin, in your experience, what are some of the challenges that autistic and neurodiverse people experience when applying for work? Uh, thank you, Jade. And I'd just like to say thank you for the invitation from the Darabin team uh, to be here today to talk autistic employment and um, for all of your efforts to ensure today goes smoothly. Uh, as president of Asperger's Victoria, I appreciate and welcome any opportunity to build understanding about our autistics. And we're very lucky today to have Thomas here on our panel who will talk about his direct experience, starting and working with the Department of Health uh, with, um, supported by Asperger's Victoria. So thank you, Thomas. Um, I'm lucky enough to live and work on the land of the Boon Wurrung people as a Kulin nation. Um, and I'd like to say thank you to Uncle Tony for his beautiful welcome today. Um, if you weren't aware, autistic unemployment is the highest of all disabilities and six times higher than the neurotypical rate of unemployment. And that's despite our autistics trying their best to seek work. Many of our autistics have amazing qualifications like Thomas and specialist knowledge and often talents that employers need. Um, autism is genetic, a neurodevelopmental bonus that people are born with. It's a different neurology and a different thinking, often with a, a high IQ and specialist abilities, but with hidden challenges. And yes, it's one of these invisible or hidden disabilities. Uh, the primary challenge for our autistics is social communication. Non-autistics don't understand autistics, and vice versa. Um, so it, we call this a double empathy issue. Both parties misunderstand each other. Simple coaching and understanding on both sides can change this double empathy issue and with simple adaptations in the way you work. Um, and you can unleash the autistic abilities in your workplace. Our autistics just think differently they have a very specialist process-based mind and they see information and detail and systems that neurotypicals miss. They also miss social cues and misinterpret social situations, especially when under workplace or interview stress. Well, um, employers really tend to see the differences and what's, what's, um, what's missing. Uh, instead, we encourage a strength-based employment approach, seeing what the person can do, not what they can't. You'll find more of their strengths and their talent will emerge with their confidence. Building understanding via Neurodiversity 101 workshops and coaching by our lived experience team um, really helps both parties. Our team work experience program is building this understanding and it's building employer capability with, um, with employment options. Critical here is not judging autistics by their diagnosis or their different ways of communicating. Each neurodivergent person is very different. See the person, not the difference. Thank you, Tamsin. Thank you for giving us a bit of the background knowledge too. Like I mentioned before, we have representation on the panel um, but if you would like to bring in other topics into the discussion, we do encourage that in the chat and the Q&A as well. Now, I'd like to hand it over to Vicky. Vicky, if you're there and you can turn your camera on. Um, Vicky, can you tell us about some of the challenges that you faced early on in your career when you're first looking for a job? Yes, um, well, I've, I've overcome many challenges in my life after contacting Polio when I was two years old. My, dis my disability is very physical and I'm not very strong and I find it very difficult to walk, but I managed to do everything by myself, which is great. Uh, I migrated from Spain with my parents at the age of eight and I spent the next two years in Australia at the Fairfield Infection Disease Hospital where I had to learn how to walk and also speak the language, which was very difficult. In, those, in the days when I was growing up, the education system is very different to what it is now. It's improved so much, it's amazing. Um, 
I had to go to a special school, which was called Urella. Um, I was in those days wasn't allowed to do the mainstream. And by the time, you know, the education was very minimal. So I was 16 when I was looking for a job. My God, I applied, applied for many jobs that I thought I was very capable of doing, but every interview question was, was asked of me was, how would I manage stairs? How was I going to go to the toilet? How was I going to get to work? Not, never once regarding my ability to be able to do the work. Eventually, there were three of us in Urella um, that uh, we find it very difficult to find the job. So um, we went on a current affairs and we were interviewed by Mark, Michael, Mike Willisby. In, in that interview, it was great. You know, we were telling them what we were able to you know, show that, but we were never given an opportunity. The next day, I actually got a, an opportunity by a company called Olivetti. Um, they had seen us on TV. Now, Olivetti was in St Kilda Road, St Kilda, and I had to travel to get two trams, and it took me an hour and a half to get work. That was a real challenge for me there. I was employed as a terminal tester, which in those days are the computer machines that uh, were being installed in, in the banks, Commonwealth and all the banks. And I played, I worked there for 15 years where I managed to work my way up to be their accountant, which I had learned by not getting a degree, just by working there. Thank you, Vicky, yeah. that's great. Everyone's bringing such a, a different perspective, which is, yeah, fantastic. Mm -hmm. Now, Tom, this question is for you. Tom, can you tell us briefly about the RISE program? and how your participation in the program helped you to gain employment? Um, yeah, so the RISE program is an initiative um, in the, well, initially started in the Department of Health um, to, um, I guess, employ um, people on the autism spectrum. And what they do uh, differently from um, other employers um, in this instance is that instead of um, using the traditional uh, method of employment, um, you know, where you'll submit your resume, have an interview, um, etc. They uh, use what they call discovery days. But they essentially get you into the workplace um, and I guess just get you to do what you'd be doing when you were in the job that you can, I guess you first observe what goes on and then you actually um, have a go at it and um, actually do the job. Um, I think it's um, especially people with autism, a much more fair and equitable, equitable way of um, doing um, the process. But I think just in general, it's a better way to make sure you're getting the best employee. Um, and um, yeah, I just think it's just, um, and, and it's, yeah, it's just been really of, great. Yeah, and helping you gain employment. So um, you could... Yeah, so I um I had a lot of trouble because I yeah I'm on the spectrum. I have I had significant difficulties in, um gaining employment. I um as mentioned before have a, a bachelor of sport and exercise science, um and just had no luck at all finding um work because I couldn't because I just had so much difficulty navigating the um the um just the process of the traditional process of work because um. And because one of the things that, um, you know, the discovery days eliminates is the fact that um, autistic people, a lot of the time, aren't good at thinking on their feet. Um, they misread cues. Um, and often their body language um, will kind of not match what people would typically um, expect for what they're saying. Um, so just getting them to do the job and, um, actually perform how it is in the workplace um, gives a much better indication um, than um, at how good they are at the job um, rather than just asking them essentially and getting them to sell themselves. Yeah, thank you. Beautiful. So thank you to the panelists for responding to the challenges. Now we're going to focus on the opportunities. So we're going to circle back. So Sue, I'd like you to answer the second question. Um, Sue, can you give it can you give us an example of something Arts Project has done to help artists overcome the challenges they face? Sure. Um, I guess the first thing that we do is we offer a dynamic 
creative studio environment that recognises the different supports that individuals require in developing their art practice. And that is absolutely different for every single person. So you cannot um, lump disability in one box and say, this is what everyone needs. It's totally um, up to the individual. So that individual support and acknowledgement is really important. Um, and we have practicing artists, uh, staff artists who work to help facilitate residencies and commissions and collaborative projects and development, but they're hands off. They don't do and they don't teach. They're there to mentor and facilitate the individual to achieve what they want to achieve. And that's really important. Um, we have a gallery that offers ethical re representation and does all the CV development proactively seeking exhibitions and sales opportunities for artists, which is exactly what a commercial gallery does for any artist in the art world. And our gallery also exhibits high quality curated exhibitions throughout the year and, and online in COVID um, to enable opportunities for sale and, um, and projects like public art projects, personal commissions, acquisitions by major institutions, it's a, sales are really good and, and a fantastic thing, but it's not just sales. It's all about the elevation of an artist's work and their portfolio and their career and their pathway. And I guess the final thing I'd say is we don't make assumptions about what people can and can't do. That's really, really important. Yeah, thank you. So, um, and I hate to say the word pivot, but Arts Project did an amazing pivot during COVID with really pushing uh, Instagram, online auction sales, to represent the artists. So that might be something that um, people in the audience might wanna hear more about after as well. Okay, thank you. So Tamsin, your second question. Tamsin, what are the benefits to employers by having strong representation of people with disability in their workforce? Well, I could go to the Foundation of Young Australians. Um, they have a future of work report. Uh, which just shows how um, diverse teams will be needed to survive the massive economic and structural change to jobs that is predicted. And it, we're already seeing it um, with AI approaching our autistics as system thinkers, and it gives a diff and gives everyone a different perspective. Um, and they're not hindered by the social norms. That's how we've always done it. Um, the evidence is that having different minds on a team dramatically improves productivity. It improves well-being for all, not just the autistics, everyone. And it improves your business reputation as well. Um, our autistics contribution is, um, it's just proving to be dramatic in most research. Higher quality work products, high dedication, loyalty, out of the box thinking with, especially with problem solving, um, you know, and the specialist minds, if you provide minimal supports, you can unleash this thinking um, to deliver exceptional results. It just makes business sense. Um, and the thing that we really see in our coaching support and when we help restructure HR approaches is that the supports that we put in place for autistic staff actually help all staff. It's a universal benefit time and again. Um, and even that even sh it shows in the education system where we're running our team work experience program. And it's the minimal adjust adjustments for our teams. teams. Uh, it's fantastic. And uh, um, I was talking last week to an MP who was the disability MP, Minister Donnellan. Um, and he described how the best people in his parliamentary office have been his Asperger autistic staff. He just loves them. And the, the different angle they will come in on the problem. And, you know, and we, he talked about how really in the past we had scientists like Einstein and, and we've had Bill Gates and Steve Jobs who are the ones that, you know, create this opportunity and we just need more employers to understand what's required. Thank you, Tamsin. Great, now Vicky, question for you. Vicky, what is something that you would like to tell employers about employing people with disability? 
Um, mate, we don't make assumption of what people can do or can't do. Um, not everyone has a master's degree. Many people with a disability are reliant and innovative thinkers because we have to be. Um, we have to always plan ahead because we don't know how places are going to be accessible. So we always have to think of ways of um, things of using equipment and you know, work to get us there. Um, the other thing I would think is to think outside the box, you know, in many ways, COG has forced a lot of employers to do that. For example, working from home, having more flexible um, hours and, um, yeah, options. And lastly, not everyone will be able to demonstrate their skill and experience in an interview. Some people might be better off showing you the demonstration. I'm not a confident, you know, I'm definitely not a confident talker. I might, I've usually done interview very well, but I've had, you know, but I know I can offer a lot and I'm very lucky that council had given me the opportunity to prove that. I've been here for 28 years in various roles and I couldn't be happier for working for having a job. Thank you, Vicky. And I love that you keep saying you're not a very confident um, speaker <laughs> or a good speaker. <laughs> Blowing us away. Um, you raise a good point, though, about COVID. You know, a lot of employers for years have been um, asked by disability advocates and particularly people with chronic illness if they can have more flexible working conditions, including working from home. So for the employers out there, when we're thinking about bringing our workplaces back after COVID, Think about things you've been doing in the last 18 months that might be worth keeping, especially if they're going to be increasing access. So working from home, flexible work options, um, definitely uh, ways of improving access in an easy, um, relatively cheap way. All right. Now, Tom, sorry to go on a tangent right before your question. You're probably sitting there waiting for it like I do. Um, your last question, Tom. Thinking about reasonable adjustments, can you give an example of an adjustment that has helped you to do your job well? Um, yeah, so for me, that would be um, the headphones that I'm wearing. Um, I got them, um, actually got through them through job access um, back not long after I started uh, working at the Department of Health in 2019. Um, I found that when I first started working, it was my first time I'd really been kind of in a workplace office environment. Um, and I, yeah, I was just really struggling. I was very distracted um, and I was also kind of pretty distractible to others as well. I was um, just really finding it difficult to kind of um, adjust to the um, environment and just get the job done. Um, and yeah, the headphones, they pretty much completely changed that. They um, just blocking out all that, um, you know, outside noise. Um, has just been like really, really um, helpful in um, just increasing my productivity and focus. Um, and uh, even though they were a you know relatively expensive pair of headphones, they paid for themselves several times over um, in terms of like benefits to productivity and help mental health and and the like. Thank you. Beautiful. Well, thank you, Tom, and thank you to all of the panellists, especially those of you sharing your lived experience. Uh, we acknowledge that can take emotional energy too, and we really appreciate you sharing your stories so that we can learn from your experiences to improve employment outcomes for people with disability. And thank you to everyone on the panel generally for sharing your time being here with us today and for all the, the practice ones that we've done too. Thank you. Now, I would like to invite Sarap from Job Access back to join us, and I'll hand the mic back to Phil to facilitate the question and answers. Thank you. Thank you, Jade. Um, and thanks to everyone uh, among the panel there. Amazing stuff. Um, I was really sort of glued um, to, to what was being said. Um, a couple of things just struck me. Uh, Tamsin said, see, see the person, not the difference. I, I think that's, uh, I think that that's sort of just absolutely um, uh, critical, uh, particularly when um, it, it, the interview process is a, a real one for, for that happening. Um, I think over the years, I've done uh, many interviews myself and been involved in the interview process. And uh, I think it's really important that people bear that in mind. Um, but also um, just the, the, the range of uh, experiences that people have had over the years 
we have some quite large employers joining us today. Um, I don't mean to sort of uh, point, point people out, but we have some very, very big employers, uh, representatives from the Northeast Link, Fulton Hogan, large engineering company, Clean Force, Bright Industries, Ability Works. Um, I'm sure all of those organizations engage with people with disability. And you can see from what's being discussed here today, uh, what the benefits of, of doing that, that are uh, and what the opportunities that, that can bring from uh, involving people with disability. In my work, I just uh, explain a little bit about what I do with the city of Darabin. Um, I work um, on employment based projects. We talk to employers, we talk to employment service providers, and there's a lot of those and very lots of new services that have come on to the scene um, in the last 12 months, 12 to 20 months. One of the things that's really striking everyone uh, is the difficulty that many employers are having re-engaging um, job seekers, uh, getting job seekers back into work. Um, many vacancies go unfilled. Uh, and, and really that's one of the purposes of doing these jobs forums is let's look in the places where you haven't looked before. Let's look in the places that you don't traditionally look. Um, the, these things that we covered in the last uh, jobs forum uh, was around employment for people from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander background, as well as people from newly arrived um, multicultural backgrounds. And here we are talking about um, people from uh, people who have disabilities and the same themes keep re-emerging. Um, these are groups of people uh, who are still being left behind in the job market. Um, and as we move uh, into that part and, and Tamsin touched on it, uh, where employers increasingly um, will have to look outside the square uh, to, to find uh, people to fill those roles. Think about the opportunities and the benefits that come from employing the people that you're not employing or not employing in the same numbers right now. Um, so let's get to some questions. Uh, so we have the Q&A function. Um, this is uh, live uh, and um, just to sort of stimulate some conversation here, Going on what you've heard uh, from the panel members and from Serap so far, uh, here's another poll that we'll just launch, uh, which might help you sort of uh, with your thinking uh, when you're thinking about what kind of a question you might like to ask the panel. Um, but I can see that we do have uh, some questions in the Q and A, um, and we have an anonymous attendee uh, who's asking, "Would you mind sharing your experience?" with approaching requests for reasonable adjustments with employers? At which point do you approach these conversations? That's a really interesting question. Um, maybe if we can throw this one to Tom. Tom, do you feel comfortable answering this question? Uh, yeah, um, just pull it up so I can see the question. Um, I think from my perspective that it kind of is, a it's kind of always been a discussion between myself and uh, my manager and what I'm comfortable kind of um, sharing with them um, and kind of making sure they're familiar with the process, um, processes they're involved with um, accessing reasonable adjustments. Because um, I think there's always, there's, there tends to be this idea that they're, you know, expensive and difficult um, to access when the reality is, um, they're really not. Um, most of them are, you know, very, um, very easy to implement and um, not, you know, not expensive, like we're fairly cheap to, um, to manage. Um, and so, yeah, I think some of them, like, I know that for me, some of them have been um, ones where I've kind of known um, that I need like certain things. Um, so I've, you know, like, um, seek, uh, seek them out myself but other times there's been things that I'm um, just from you know having good communi communication with my manager and other people um, I work with um, they've actually suggested things to me that I wouldn't have um, necessarily picked up on um, that have also been um, very helpful for me as well. Have they been difficult conversations Tom for you to have with those employees? Um, no, in my instance, they haven't been, but I think, yeah, for a lot of people, it really can be a very um, difficult um, discussion. It, um, it really, I think, depends on, um, you know, a lot of how disability confident your manager and people you're working with are um, and, you know, how comfortable um, the individual is 
um, you know, sharing details of their disability and things that they struggle with. Um, I'm, yeah, pretty lucky that I, um, you know, work in communicable disease. So everyone is, you know, very um, health literate and very, um, and I, I guess, understanding. Um, so it's, um, it makes it probably, I'm probably at a pretty significant advantage relative to a lot of other people um, in that regard. I um, understand that um, both Serap and uh, Tamsin would also like to contribute uh, to this question. Um, Serap? Thanks, Phil. I was just typing up a, a, an answer, actually. Um, look, we encourage employers to be forthcoming with those questions. We ask them in our recommendations of our recruitment reviews, we ask that employers ask the question to the candidates at every stage of the recruitment process, um, almost every stage of the recruitment process from the very beginning. Um, when you have your um, the application questions that when, when candidates are applying online, put a question in there around reasonable adjustments. Like, do you need any support to progress with this recruitment? Um, or do you require any reasonable adjustments? And, and, you know, we leave it up to the candidate there to share that information. Um, and of course, if they get shortlisted for an interview, for example, we would recommend that the employers ask the question again in, in that shortlisted uh, email that you might send or the phone call, you know, do you need any support to progress to the, um, you know, to progress to the, the next part of the recruitment process, um, and so on and so forth. Um, the more the more candidates will hear it, the more comfortable they will feel in sharing, um, you know, any support that they might need. And Tamsin? Uh, yeah, I was um, just saying that really we find that earlier these can be requested the better because often the issue will build. Um, and uh, the issue in recruitment and uh, the earlier asking, the employee asking the questions is often the autistic will not know until they're in that situation. So if there is some way that you can predict the adjustments they might require, I mean, we do provide advice around recruitment adjustments, which are very simple, such as providing the questions beforehand, uh, giving them a timetable of how it's going to go, what's going to happen, who's going to be there. Um, simple preparation and explanation of what their situation will involve really goes so, a long way. And in the environment, if you if the person is a bit nervous about asking, if they have a social mentor they could talk to or a, a coach, you know, so we do job coaching to talk through what sort of adjustments might help because often the autistic may not know what, what is reasonable and what's available. Thank you, thank you for addressing that question. Um, so we go to the next question. Um, uh, again, I think from the, maybe the same person, what do you think is the biggest barrier within the traditional recruitment process? Um, and how can this be changed? Uh, so perhaps if I throw this one to Tamsin. Uh, well, at the moment, the biggest barrier for our autistics is recruitment. Uh, a job interview really is how good are you at job interviews? It's not how good you are at the job. And um, a bit social communication being a big issue, um, it's really a huge barrier. And even just the wording in your um, job uh, advertisement can be a barrier because the interpretation is um, critical for our autistics. So there's very simple approaches in that, um, how um, autistics can gain employment, um, but it really goes to the employer being very open to differences. And you can feel that, you can feel the culture and, and I think that will help really help reduce the barrier. And, and asking, as, as Sarah said, asking them what they need, what can help, is, is really important to reduce your barriers. Thank you. Would anyone else like to contribute yeah. to the answer to that question? Yeah, Sarah. absolutely. Just having open, honest conversations from the very beginning with, with um, this is on part of the employer, having those open, honest conversations yeah. with the employee can go a long way in making people um, feel comfortable in, in sharing any adjustments or any requirements that they might have. Um, yeah, that, that's what I wanted to say. But we we did a, there was a, not we, but we, there was a study that was commissioned in December 2018 by the Department of Jobs and Small Businesses, and they examined employer behaviours, attitudes and intentions towards hiring and retaining people with health conditions that impacted their ability to work. 
Um, they surveyed almost 2,500 people that were in, involved in uh, hiring and management of staff and development of staff policies and initiatives, et cetera. This was across small to large organisations, and they found the most common barriers for uh, um, employers employing people with a disability was fear of the unknown, um, fear of offending, um, lack of skills and resources, liability, having a liability and compliance mindset, lack of leadership, um, uh, low confidence levels, and, and the employers having a disability focus rather than focusing on the individual as a whole, focusing on, on the person's disability. I just wanted to share that, um, that the common barrier that we found there. Thanks, Sarah. So we move to the next question. Uh, this is from Ariana Evans. Um, do you know how many companies in the city of Darabin employ staff that experience barriers to employment? Um, that's possibly a question for, for us in economic development. Um, it's it's a, not a great, not an easy question to answer. I know of some um, that, uh, that have uh, policies around employing people with disability. Um, we have one that will be joining us later this morning, Clean Force, uh, who has uh, an open and inclusive employment policy and uh, actually goes out of their way to employ people with disability uh, and build their teams around them. Um, there are other organisations uh, who do employ people with disability, uh, but maybe perhaps not um, in the same numbers. Uh, so there are others. What I would encourage, I know that we have employers uh, joining us this morning. Uh, if any of those employers would like to contribute to that answer and say, yes, we do. Um, and we have policies around and strategies around bringing people on board who have disability. Uh, we would welcome that. Um, Ariana, it might be useful also, perhaps if you let us know um, where you're, you're from, what organisation you're from. Um, anyone else like to contribute to that answer? I'm not sure that anyone actually else, anyone else has an answer to that question. Okay, so yeah, if, if we do have employers in there, um, so we've got um, people from Ability Works who are joining us, not specifically in Darabin, but uh, a fabulous organisation employing people with disability. We'll get to that question from them in just a second. If I can move to a question here from Rob. Uh, Rob Cristani is asking, with more employers coming on board, why do the panel think people won't share that they live with a disability when applying for roles? I guess that's a question going back to the recruitment and in interview process. Um, Rob, uh, I think perhaps is indicating um, that uh, that's a factor sometimes in interviews that people won't declare their disability. Um, why would that be? Perhaps if I address that question to Vicky, can you think of a reason why that would be the case? Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> um, I guess, yeah, mainly you don't want to put too many barriers because you kind of want to try and get through your first step. Um, I mean, interviewing sometimes pretty hard, so trying to also come across and, and ask for help or what, what you might need to get the employment. That might stop them from employing you. So I guess I, I wouldn't, for myself, when I did the early years, um, I just had to when they asked questions, I just sort of answered as best I could. And if I had, when I started work, I tried to think of ways that I could overcome those barriers. And once I got to a stage where now I really needed help, I got the confidence a little bit to ask for whatever needed to be done. So it is a hard question to ask. I think I can add to that a little bit too, Vic. Um, you know, for one thing, people don't have to disclose or talk about their disability um, unless there's a real need for them to do that for the job or for serious health and safety concerns, but generally people legally do not have to talk about their disability. Um, and the other reason why some people might not want to talk about it is fear of discrimination. Um, a lot of people are discriminated against with disability in the employment space. There's a history of that. It contributes to unemployment. So. In a job interview, you're still building trust. You're still getting to know people. You don't necessarily know what the organization's values are or how they respond to talking about um, disability. The person in front of you might be great hearing it, but maybe the HR person you know, has different processes. So it's about fear of discrimination. Um, and yet, unless people need to tell you, they don't need to, you, know, you just need to make sure that your processes are accessible for everybody. So everybody has a fair go. 
Thank you. Thank you, Jade. Um, the next question, maybe Jade might be the best person to respond to this question also. Could you share your views on what role could council play in linking in and supporting people with disabilities and prospective employers? What would need to happen for these relationships to be productive and sustainable? And that's for a question from Anya Saraki. Um, Jade, would you like to take a swing at that one? Sure, I guess there are different aspects to this and the next part of the forum will cover that as well. There are supports available at council. We have an economic development team where there are staff um, job advocates who are based in this room as well who can, can assist. We also have a disability access and inclusion team um, and part of my role is focusing on economic participation for people with disabilities. So I guess one of the ways is keeping involved. So sign up to the newsletters. I know you probably all get a thousand of them in your inbox, but pick ours. Um, we have a monthly newsletter, so it's good to hear about what's going on in the community to increase employment for people with disability, whether it's programs or services or internship opportunities and the like. Thanks, Jade. I'd also add to that um, from the Economic Recovery and Resilience team. Um, the work that we've been doing in recent months has been mapping uh, the various services and supports that are available to people uh, who are disadvantaged in the, um, in the employment scene. Uh, Jade mentioned Jobs Advocates. This is a new program that's been introduced where we have uh, people who work directly with job seekers, looking to help them overcome barriers um, and linking them into services where they can find jobs or training. Uh, we also have um, programs now such as local jobs coordinators who work regionally um, and look to address the specific issues that are happening within their regions. Um, and uh, included in those local jobs coordinator programs are often um, task forces that include employers. Uh, so in all of these forums, these sorts of issues are being raised. Um, we'd also uh, acknowledge that we work at the moment uh, quite a lot with Brotherhood of St. Lawrence uh, through a, a JVES or a Jobs Victoria program. Um, and many of the uh, interactions we have with those programs are around people who are disadvantaged and disengaged in the, in the uh, job seeking area, including people with disabilities. Um, so it's, it's a work in progress. It's always been a work in progress and it will probably continue to be a work in progress for many years to come. Um, but the interesting thing is that there are now more supports, more infrastructure. The task, I suppose, is um, to have those supports and services working effectively and working with each other um, in a and in a complementary way. Um, so that's a role that um, you know perhaps uh, the people who are joining us, not necessarily those on the panel, but those participants who do come from service providers, uh, a role for them um, to uh, to address uh, in in the, all of those supports. Um, so moving on to the next question. Um, and top of my list, uh, I've got um, uh, Ray, Shannon and Stacey, all from Ability Works, uh, who I've just mentioned before, great organisation. They've got a question for Tamsin around how we can connect with potential employees from the Autism Asperger's community. Um, and they'd also like to say thank you for their fabulous presentation. Um, Tamsin, would you like to answer that question? Sure. Uh, thanks for that question, Ray. Uh, we are a lived experience organisation. We have members that are from teenage right through to in aged care. So we have access to autistics of uh, various um, ages, qualifications, everything. And basically we, um, if you have a role that you're interested in employing, we can work with you to make sure it's autistic suitable and um, put it out to our network of job seekers, which we have many. And we're also networked across with other organisations as well. Uh, we're part of the Autism Advisory Group for the government. So really just approach us. And my, I've got Sophia as our programs manager. She would work with you. Thank you. Thanks, Tamsin. I believe some questions are being answered also in the background um, directly with the people. So please correct me if I'm wrong about that. And um, uh, please, Jade, if I'm missing things, um, bring those to my attention. Um, as people who know me know, my multitasking is not my strongest suit. Uh, so so we'll, we'll plow on. Um, Lisa's, uh, Lisa Forbes, uh, who is one of the aforementioned jobs advocates, uh, is asking a question. Any advice on how to ask for PT, public transport, I'm assuming you're talking about there, Lisa, no? Part-time. Um, Part-time, when the position is advertised as full-time. 
Um, Sarah, would you like to perhaps um, address that one? Um, look, I think just having the conversation with the employer is, is a start talking about, you know, what are the, um, is the employee able to fulfill the inherent requirements of the role in a part-time capacity? Um, coming forth, this is probably applicable for anyone really, not just people with a disability, but, um, you know, having a, um, an idea of how it could work if they were to go part time, could they put forward, you know, a job sharing opportunity where, um, you know, they can't got work full time anymore because um, of, of, of you know, due to a disability. So maybe they could split the role requirements in two and have someone else do the role um, requirements that they aren't able to do due to a disability. Um, that that's what I would have to say there. I think just having the conversation and and, and seeing how they can make this work. Right. Thank you. I could add I could add yes. something there if you'd like. Uh, yeah. I just uh, I was reading yesterday an article about as we're coming back from lockdown, employers are going to find more of this happening is the prediction, and it won't be just for disabled staff. It will be everyone, and the move towards the four day week and all of that. Yeah. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we'll be moving on to a, another um, area fairly soon. We'll be introducing a couple of other guests, but um, there's a couple more questions in here and statements. Um, Ariana's qualified uh, that she's from Outlook, which I actually did know. I was just pretending I didn't know Ariana. Um, you're uh, from a leading social enterprise based in Victoria, uh, operating out of transfer stations on behalf of councils, one of which is in Reservoir. Um, so Outlook uh, Environment um, operates the transfer station out in Reservoir uh, and employs approximately 44 staff with a disability and over 80% that form part of the priority workforce categories. Um, I'm aware of Outlook and the great work that, that you do, Ariana. Thank you very much for qualifying that. Um, and I'd just like to perhaps bring in um, Sue at this point um, when we're talking about social enterprise, as, uh, as was just uh, mentioned. Um, Arts Project Australia is, of course, a social enterprise. Um, I'd like to, this is just a question from me, what role do you think social enterprise plays in uh, employment of people, not just with disability, but uh, the employment of uh, people who are traditionally disadvantaged in the workplace? Oh, enormous. Um, and I think really, for most social enterprises, it's a part of their raison d'etre. It's, it's part of their mission um, because not only does a social enterprise, do, do the profits go back in to support the building of the, the business, um, they don't go off to shareholders or anything like that, but generally a social enterprise has um, at least, you know, a cohort or a cause or, you know, something in mind. And for instance, Arts Project Australia's purpose is to support artists with intellectual disabilities. That's, that's what we do. Um, we support, we promote, we advocate. So everything we do has to kind of sit in that box. And I wanted to bring up something that we were doing outside of building artist careers. And we decided uh, probably timing wasn't perfect, but <laughs> around the end of 2019, we decided that we would implement a traineeship program within Arts Project uh, because we recognise that for many people uh, with intellectual disabilities anyway, actually having any experience is, is really one of the first hurdles and the first barriers. So to get, how do you get that experience? So we, um, we decided to implement a traineeship program within our own organisation, which we offered to our population and people went through um, chats and interviews and that sort of thing. Um, and we worked with um, a DARES, a disability uh, employment service called um, Interact Australia. Now, so if you're an employer out there, if you work with a, a DARES, they manage all the Centrelink pay, paperwork, all that sort of stuff that an employer doesn't really want to do. Um, they'll also work with you in terms of uh, setting up the a trainee, intern, employee in, in what they're doing. And they provide an ongoing mentor, independent of your organisation, to liaise with the employee, see how they're going. Might be things the employee 
doesn't feel they can say to you, they can say to their mentor and they, that will get fed back. And we found that process fantastic. We've um, moved, we're on our third trainee now, gaining skills in both our studio and gallery. And I guess the added plus was one of our um, long-term partners, Leonard Joel Auction House, when the CEO heard what we were doing, he said, I want one of those, I wanna do that too. So we've had one of our artists um, in a trainee program and getting, but not getting paid super low wages, getting paid the wages that we all get paid, um, working with them, obviously the last year has been a bit touch and go in terms of being there, but they've worked across a range of Leonard Joel departments and it really, they were terrified. Lena Joel were terrified. They didn't know what to expect. And I think having just gone through this process, they're now feeling a lot more comfortable about employing the next person with a disability. So I really recommend working with other network, your, your networks. This is something that you can do together as a project. It's, um, it's fantastic. And you're giving people really valuable on the job experience. If you can't offer, a long-term role going forward, you're still able to offer a really good grounding in skills development. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Sue. I'm so glad you mentioned um, DES providers. Uh, we have a number of those joining us um, here today, represented uh, in the audience. Um, and the traineeship path, uh, just a, a bit of bit of background. Um, I used to work with an organization called Apprenticeships Plus, who are uh, a, um, a group training organization. Uh, and um, uh, the role of group training is to um, employ, uh, also become a legal employer and then mentor um, people as they go through their traineeship or apprenticeship um, journey. Uh, and often we would engage uh, with um, disability service providers um, to look for uh, people um, to employ into those roles. So, um, yeah, thank you very much for bringing that up and, and thank you for those comments. And it was, it was great to hear that, that particular aspect. Um, so in just closing the Q&A um, section now, uh, now there, were, there will be some time for people to join in the conversation again um, after the next bit. Uh, so don't panic. Uh, there'll be some time for people to have a bit of a chat. Uh, I know we didn't get to Tesfu's question about the cold communities. Um, Tesfu, what, what I would say in answer to that question is the last forum we ran uh, was specifically about uh, people from a newly arrived and uh, multicultural background. Um, and there is a recording of that um, forum available, uh, which we can make available to you. If your question was more specifically about people with disability, uh, please, if maybe if you want to save that question for after this next bit. Um, so where we're going now, and I would just, um, I knew I'd forget about this, but the, the poll that we launched, uh, so we did have a poll active. Um, I'm trying to find the results of it. If uh, maybe Jade or someone there can help me find that. Um, but so we had a poll active, which was all about, um, uh, it was all about uh, what people can do. Thank you, whoever just put that up there. Uh, what people could, could do to help uh, or what do you think could help? And it was being stimulated by the conversation, of course, we were just having. And, and uh, what it looks like is that many people uh, who are with us today um, are really suggesting that increased awareness of the benefits of employing people with a disability in the workplace uh, would be a really great way uh, to help other employers and encourage other employers to do this. Um, a better, also a better understanding of how to implement inclusive workplace practices um, and hearing more positive examples of diverse workplaces. And I think we've been hearing about some of those today and we're about to hear about another one. Um, so this is very timely. I'll just stop sharing um, that and uh, you can see the results of that poll. So thank you again um, to our amazing panel, uh, to Sue, Tamsin, Tom and Vicky, uh, and also to Sarah. Thank you very much. Um, now we're going to introduce a very special guest, a, um, a gentleman that I've had the pleasure of working with um, for a few years now. Um, when I first started at Darabin Council, uh, I was asked to look into these, these new things, these newfangled things that were going on called social enterprises. Um, and we tried to find some that were based in Darabin and we came across Clean Force Property Services that are based in, um, in Preston. And at the time I, uh, I met with Jim um, and at the time his partner there, Paul, um, and uh, was amazed by the work they were doing and how they were doing it. 
Um, they're a commercial cleaning organization, but there's so much more than that. Um, so I'd like to introduce you to Jim. Jim, if you'd like to turn your camera and, uh, and microphone on, um, I believe you're there with us uh, at the moment. Can you thanks, hear me, Philip? There <clears throat> yeah, is. thanks, Philip. Yep, I'm here. Yeah, thank you. Good to see your face. Thank you very um, much for joining us. Uh, thanks, Philip. Uh, thanks for uh, allowing me to share uh, my little story of Clean Force with everyone. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it's been Clean Force is twenty years old, so we've got a big uh, milestone this year. So it's been great. Okay. Can you tell us about Clean Force? What does Clean Force do, and maybe something about its recruitment practices? Certainly, and uh, I've made some notes because I'm I'm not very good on the fly, so I'll just I'll read out some notes for everyone, and hope you'll you'll get a really good understanding. Uh, Clean Force Property Services, uh, we are an Australian disability enterprise and a social enterprise, uh, and one of many programs operated by not-for-profit organisation Wise Employment. Clean Force's model is based around a commercial contract cleaning business. And the primary purpose for our existence is to provide meaningful and sustainable employment for people who may have been previously excluded from the general labour market due to chronic enduring mental illness, you know, such, as, such as schizophrenia, bipolar, anxiety, depressive disorders, as well as many other types of disadvantages. Our enterprises are designed to provide our employees from disadvantaged backgrounds with a tailored training and support program. Um, and this enables them to develop valued vocational and non-vocational skills that all employees seek, thereby increasing their independence, their confidence, their social skills, and increased levels of participation within the broader community. Clean Force leads the way for other social enterprises through best practice of having an integrated workforce. We pay full award wages. We ensure staff are trained and supported and maintaining high standards of work and health and safety, delivering superior customer service, we believe we do, um, community and, and business education, all while creating a sustainable and rapidly growing social enterprise. Clean Force's business model is linked to its strategy to, the, to deliver social outcomes to its commercial priorities. Clean Force de delivers constantly high quality cleaning services while providing an employment environment structured to meet the unique needs of our employees. And that's significant on the job support, flexible hours, gradually, and, and, and as time goes by, actually, gradually increasing their workloads. Clean Force currently has a it has a blended workforce. Uh, we have uh, approximately 40% of our employees are diagnosed with a disability. They come through obviously the NDIS program. And of those 70, and of those 70% have persistent and severe mental illness, of which 54% have psychosis-based conditions such as schizophrenia. The remaining 40% are identified among the following groups, new arrivals, yes, new, new Recent, especially recently settled refugees, people receiving welfare benefits, those living in social housing and other part-time cleaning professionals. Approximately 19% of our employees are from uh, the cultural and linguistically diverse backgrounds. We started back in 2001. So, um, you know, we I did really want me to go back. I, I suppose that's, that's pretty much who we are up to date. So... Um, Fantastic. Thanks, Jim. Thanks for that, uh, that, that, that history. Um, I understand you're extremely busy at the moment too, that you have, uh, that you've been a, a victim of your success because you've got so much work on. We have. Look, it's been the last two years have been, while they've been amazing for all of us in all different, different ways um, for our, especially our supported employees, they've really, they're, I wouldn't say embrace, but they've really, really shown what they can do and their, their keenness to, to keep working. Um, and as long as they've been really uh, supported within that, um, our workload has increased dramatically, obviously, due to COVID. And a lot of that is, um, apart from uh, what we do a fair bit of COVID cleaning, but we also do quite a bit of sanitising for a lot of our customers. 
Um, the bulk of our customers at the moment, uh, we do quite a bit of work for the infrastructure projects. And um, so th they've kept us very busy. But our guys uh, have, have been instrumental in maintaining that, that work, that workload. So could you maybe um, tell us um, how has Clean Force incorporated workers with a disability into your teams and what's been the benefits? What's been the benefits to the working culture? Um, from having people with disability uh, engaged in those teams? Well, uh, thanks, Philip. Well, initially, um, we, Clean Force was not integrated. We uh, actually, we just targeted supported employees. We had a, a, probably a, a dozen employees that obviously came through, through the system. But um, the way we sort of built our model was um, in what we call them crews where they would go out of an evening with a, a supported in, a training and workplace uh, trainer. And uh, you know, he'd have four or five employees together and they would go out and they'd visit multiple sites of an evening. They'd go three, four sites. And while they were there, and you've got to remember, 100% of our supported employees came with no experience. So they'd never done cleaning before in their life. And even today, a lot of our, support employees don't have that experience. So we pretty much employ everybody and we train them. But the good thing about being in, a, in that model with that crew was that they actually worked off each other also. They, they, they discussed ideas. They were able to, you know, so the, the trainer would show the group how to do a specific task and then they'd all get together. And, and, then, and as time went on, then we'd actually, then we thought about blending the workforce. But the bulk of our supported employees, even today, work in, we probably, today we have about four or five crews that go out of a night time, they go out with, it, with a support worker and that support worker. So a new person would come in, join the crew and would build his skills up through, through the crews. As time goes by, if that person, has more confidence instead of working. And what we would try to do instead of, uh, but of, because they couldn't work five days a week or eight hours a day, we'd, we'd look at the rosters and they'd probably work a, a five day fortnight. So within those other five days, we started incorporating uh, mainstream cleaners. So, and that's how we sort of started that integration process by having, um, you know, open cleaners working right alongside supported employees, which again was it was embraced by both sides. But it also the funny thing is it gave the open cleaners or even open customers a different perspective and a better understanding. Um, you know, when Clean Force started twenty years ago, disability services it was it was very very tough to break into the to the market of you know. Of, because we did commercial cleaning, it was around commercial cleaning and, and people had a lot of doubts if somebody with a disability could succeed. But I, and, and as we all know, you know, that's, that's been proven wrong. Because the, the um, I suppose I rely more on supported employee, not taking sick leave, not being off, off uh, on, on medical. You know, they're more in, a supported employee knowing that they have that support is less chance of becoming unwell again. And um, because they know uh, if I do become unwell, I know I've got, you know, Jim and the team, they'll, they'll make sure I'm, I don't have that fear of losing my job as you would maybe in mainstream. They know that, could you, yep, let's talk about it. Let's see what the problem is. Let's, let, let's discuss your ideas. And, um, they tend to come back much, much sooner. Uh, that it's definitely worked for both sides, you know, whether it be supported, whether it be, be uh, mainstream. But uh, and to, up until today, 20 years later, we are still running crews. We feel that that's the best way that we can do it. Jim, I'm aware that um, many uh, organisations have social procurement policies. Um, the state government, for example, uh, has its social procurement framework. 
um, and uh, a lot of the state government instrumentalities and the major infrastructure players um, do uh, have as part of their KPIs um, that they need to demonstrate that they're engaging with uh, organisations like yourself and other organisations, um, Aboriginal based organisations, etc. Um, has that social procurement activity, has that led to an increase in, in work for clean force? Um, and so would you say that then uh, the employment model that you had has actually been good for business? Look, uh, absolutely, Philip. Uh, look, the, the social procurement framework has worked exceptionally well for us. Um, you, know, you know, having said that, we've put a lot of work into it. We've had a lot of... Um, so we've had to prove ourselves to the construction industry, um, but it's definitely proven that um, you know anybody can do the role. If they've got the right training, the right supports, and the right structure behind them, that they carry out that work. And um, you know, today, we within the within the infrastructure projects, we probably employ anywhere up to about 60 employees, 60, 70 employees. It, it has been, um, I suppose the last few years have really increased. Just to give you an idea, this year we will probably turn around. We, we uh, Clean Force currently, we probably have about 220 staff. We will probably generate close to $8 million just uh, Clean Force in Melbourne. So That's brilliant. It's been very good. So yeah, absolutely fantastic. And and obviously, you know, word of mouth has been the, one of our biggest resources within the social uh, within the infrastructure projects. And um, we just keep getting called back, and which is which is good. So well, I just got a message. They've got a great. Yeah. 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 Uh, sorry, Philip. No, it's uh, it's that mix. But the great thing that comes out of it is. A lot of, and it's hard to sort of, but mainstream people, people that work at these sites, you know, normally they, they're they at a different level. They're, they're union people, they're, you know, high-level management, but yet they work with our staff and they get a, a so much better understanding of, okay, how can we help you guys? You guys do a fantastic job. How, how can we help your guy, you know, improve or get more hours or... or so. I think it's the exposure and, and a better understanding of how social enterprises are capable of providing and not just cleaning, you know, there's gardening, there's there's so many other social enterprises out there doing different, providing a different service. Thank, thanks for that. And I've just said in the chat, um, uh, I've just seen a message from Howard Williams from the North East Link project. Uh, big shout out to Jim. Thanks for the work that you and the team do with us on the North East Link project. Um, so there's a bit of a kudos for you there, Jim. No, um, thanks. <laughs> I have one last request to make of you. Uh, we did have a request um, for you to share your email address. Uh, if you feel comfortable doing this, um, yes, if you get a chance, if you can pop that into the chat function in the Zoom room there. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, that way people can, can, can get in touch with you um, outside of this. Um, so I'd like to thank you again, Jim, uh, for giving up your time to come along to this this morning. Really appreciate that. Um, are you able to stick around for another 20 minutes or so as we get into I, some Q&A? Because there may be I some questions for you as well. Definitely will. And thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. And thanks, everybody. Beautiful. Thank you very much for that, Jim. Uh, and if you do have questions for Jim, just pop them in the Q&A function and we'll get to those uh, in just a minute. Um, but now we'd like to introduce our final guest for this morning, uh, Mr. Michael Benfari. Um, Michael is from Department of Jobs, Precincts and Regions uh, on the Jobs Victoria program. And he's going to talk to us about um, what Jobs Victoria is up to uh, in terms of a um, disability specific project. Uh, and we'll also uh, briefly mention about uh, employer incentives, about um, how employers can um, gain incentives from employing people with disability. So it's over to you, Michael. Good morning. Morning, Phil. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, oh, well, it's actually afternoon now. I just noticed by two minutes. So, um, great. So, um, thank. This is a wonderful forum. I've I really enjoyed um, all the guest speakers. So, I won't hold up the time too much because I know we're a little bit tired. So, what I'll do is, um, can I share my screen, Phil, at all? Or? Go for it. It's on the screen yeah. right now, in fact. 
I'll oh, do I've, it. I think someone else was sharing the screen. Maybe if you want to try that. <laughs> yeah, I'll do that quickly. I'll just um, I'm going to drive that. All set up if that's all right. So, shan't be too long. That's the one there. And share. Jeez, I haven't used um, Zoom for a while because we use Teams. So, it's all. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so just bear with me while this opens. Beautiful. There we are. So just a quick intro to what we do. As you probably are aware, um, Jobs Victoria funds quite a number of services. Um, I look after the Metro North. So I oversee, obviously, the advocates, the um, JVs slash mentors, as they call themselves now, and career counselling. But there's a little bit of a hidden factor in, um, in the in some of the programs that we run, such as the Youth Employment Scheme, and now there's a disability stream. So what's involved is basically these people are eligible to work in the Victorian public se sector. So anyone with a disability can apply. It's generally youth around the ages from 17 to 29. So 29 is not a bad age considering it's still under the banner of youth. Um, the, most people who are eligible must be unemployed or not working more than 15 hours at the moment. And preference, preference will be given to those who have been unemployed for six months or more. However, it's, it's usually um, you know, tested case by case. So each case is reviewed um, and you know, just to make sure that the eligibility is, is the right fit for the person too. Um, currently not studying tertiary education and do not have post school qualification. Once again, reviewed by the department. And you know, I have heard of stories that there are people who have um, completed diplomas and even bachelors and they've still ended up in, the, in a role with the VPS. Um, Identify as having a disability that is permanent and unlikely to change. So that's why we're here today and have experienced challenges in securing sustainable employment. So just listening to some of the guest speakers earlier about you know, just those challenges in getting employment and maintaining that employment is quite important. So that's the first one. I'll click to the next one. Um, so the traineeships are in the Victorian Public Service. Currently, there are four positions available. Um, through the financial year of 21-22, um, there will be 23 positions within the VPS. Um, these may still grow even further, depending on the success of the, um, of the program. There will be a variety of roles over different departments in the VPS. Each job will be managed by a, a group training organisation, and the people will be directly employed by the group training organisation. So that's how it's, it's run, but it's all been funded by VPS. And they will obviously support, train and guide each person through their employment. And the jobs will be tailored to suit the person's needs, needs and reasonable adjustments will be made according to the person's requirements. And also just to, um, for a bit of an encouragement for, now this is outside the VPS now. So if people are looking to employ, so we've got employers out in the main, um, yeah, just in the main fields, um, there is a Jobs Victoria Fund. Um, it's up to, so the eligibility is, is varied. Um, you, you, each person can attract up to $20,000 in wage subsidies. So there, is, there are two levels, there's 20,000 and 10,000. I won't go that, into that detail today because it's quite a bit to talk through that. However, um, so the main priority job seekers that, the, you know, that we're looking at are women aged over 45, job seekers who are long-term unemployed, uh, job seekers registered with the Jobs Vic Partner, so our, our mentor services, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, people with disability, people seeking asylum slash refugees, um, migrants, young people aged under 25, people aged over 45, veterans, and people previously employed under the Working for Victoria initiative. Now, it's quite vast. I don't think there's any real limitation to um, accessing these funds for an employer. So it's all, once again, all assessed and case by case scenario. And most of the time from what I've heard, they've been pretty much approved. So that's pretty much it. And I'll just have contact details if you, I'll, I can share these around later if you like, but um, I've put my name and details in the chat. So feel free to call anytime. Always happy to have a chat to someone. So. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Michael. Um, that was that was short and sweet, um, and uh, gave us a lot of information. But uh, look, if people do have a, any specific questions for Michael about um, Jobs Victoria or about what they've just heard, um, particularly those programs or the incentives, uh, then this is the time to do it. Um, because what we're going to do now, uh, this is the fun part. 
Um, I'd encourage uh, those who are able to, uh, if you want to um, turn your cameras and uh, certainly turn your cameras back on, um, because we're going to now throw it open um, to the audience uh, to ask questions um, or to uh, perhaps just contribute uh, to the discussion rather than asking questions. I'm going to rely also on my colleagues a bit uh, too um, for those things that I miss um because i I'm, i probably won't cover everything or won't notice everything that's in there i know there's a lot of activity that's been happening in the chat um so we might want to just um get into that but i would also one of the things that we did uh, in the last um uh, forum that we ran um is give the panel members an opportunity to ask questions or to talk about other things themselves so if there are panel members there who would like to actually raise a question of the audience members, uh, perhaps you'd like to ask them a question or uh, to make a point about who else is in the room, uh, perhaps draw our attention to different people who are out there. Um, lovely uh, for you. This is an opportunity for you to do that. So panel members, do you have any questions of the audience? No. They do love that silence. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's okay. Always uh, interested to do something a little bit different. We have, um, we did have someone who had uh, their hand up uh, a little while back. Uh, Mary, um, you had your hand up. Uh, was there a question that you wanted to ask of the panel members or the guests at this point? if I can see a question going in the Q&A function or in the chat function. No, everyone's just gone very quiet here all of a sudden. Um, we do have this opportunity. There's also, of course, we have uh, Jim from Clean Force that you can ask questions of, as well as Michael from Jobs Victoria. Um, we have, uh, I've just noticed that um, Sue Boyce from AbilityWorks uh, has um, just uh, posed a question to hosts and panelists. Um, what are others doing to encourage people back to work post lockdown? Uh, we're also in the situation where we have a number of people worried about returning to the workplace. Um, this is an interesting uh, observation, Sue. Thank you very much for this. Um, something we have been discussing in the lead up to this forum, given, of course, that we have been in lockdown. Um, there's a suggestion that for some people that was actually a positive thing that they could work from home. Uh, that they that it that employers were more agreeable to having people work from home, uh, but now of course there'll be the situation will be reversed and people will be encouraged back into the workplace. Uh, so um, you know what's 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 happening on on that front. Um, uh, Tamsin, is there any any contribution you'd like to make to that that observation about um, people returning to the workplace? Uh, well, I do know at the moment that autistics have the lowest vaccination rate. So we've been doing some communication around that. And um, Amaze have put together some resources around uh, vaccination, but also supports of getting back into life. Uh, that's on their website. It was also on our Facebook. Um, so I think we're all trying to gather resources to support that. Um, we do have, we've been running COVID coaching uh, for some of our community, which was where our lived experience coaches donated time to help people to talk things through like that. So yeah, there's a few things happening um, for our autistics, which is great. Jim, as an employer uh, of uh, many people who have disability, um, what are your plans for bringing people back into the workplace? You're on mute there, mate. Sorry, Phil. Uh, well, bringing everybody back is, is where we've always been back in a sense. Um, the vaccination, obviously, the vaccination numbers are played a fair important part in that role of getting everybody, everybody back. But um, I, I have to say that I'm really proud of all our supported employees who actually you know, put their hand up very quickly to to continue and maintain their employment uh, at work, especially while there were conditions from a lot of our customers. But um, we actually have not had any supported employees who have turned around and said, um, 
we're not getting back. So from our point of view, it's great because it's continuity of their employment and businesses moving forward. So. Great point. Thanks, Jim. Um, the next question is uh, directly for uh, Michael Benfari. Um, Michael, um, can you answer the question, what is the best way to apply for the Youth Employment Scheme roles? Yep, um, good question. They, look, generally, on um, they, they do run the online uh, Jobs Vic Hub, which is basically where all VPS jobs are normally um, promoted, the, the internal VPS jobs, and they're open to public, of course. So, look, I can provide a link later on also around that. I do know if you go on the, the um, Victorian government, state government website too, the roles are normally advertised through there as well. So um, that's another option. But if you do get stuck and you want to actually speak to a specific person within the department who's doing that hiring, you can contact me and I can certainly try and link you up to those people to have that discussion as well. So, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. I've just been prompted. Um, the question that we had before about um, uh, preparations for people returning to the workplace. Uh, perhaps if there's other employers in the Zoom room right now who would like to respond to that, uh, perhaps they'd like to just uh, bring up um, what they're doing or some of the issues that are that are being faced um, by employers uh, with um, with people returning to the workplace. Um, you can pop that uh, answer in, in the chat, um, or if there's something that uh, you'd really like to get off your chest, you, you can raise your hand. And we do have the ability, we have the technology to actually promote people onto the screen. Um, so if you've got a burning desire to appear on the screen uh, along with the, the rest of our guests, um, please raise your hands, we, we can do that. Um, but while that's going on, I just uh, draw your attention to the last of the polls that we have running. Um, this poll is about the structures uh, that to, to support people um, with disability in the workplace. Uh, it's a bit of a, I guess, a, a bit of a, a teasing sort of question, knowing that we have many representatives uh, in the Zoom room who are uh, working as um, support services. Uh, we've got disability employment service representatives. Uh, we've got um, uh, people who um, who employ people with disability uh, through group training, etc. Um, my co my ex colleague Adrian O'Brien is one of those. He's made himself known uh, to the audience here. Um, so I would just like to perhaps ask, uh, draw your attention to that poll um, about whether you think the structures are actually in place to support people. What I can see, um, it, it's early days yet, uh, but there's uh, the question is. Do you agree or disagree that the structures are in place? And at the moment, um, slight edge to people who disagree that the structures are actually not in place. Um, so that's a really interesting one to grapple with. Um, and maybe we might uh, see if there are um, providers in the room that might want to um, um, address that particular uh, point. Um, but the next question we've got uh, in the Q&A is from Martha. And this is, what would you recommend in supporting someone who you are confident has a cognitive disability, but that they might not be aware of themselves or have not shared that with you. Um, I would any of our panelists like to address, uh, to answer that question? Otherwise I'll pick someone. I could start it off if you'd Tamsin, like. Thank you, go for it. Well, I'm, an, I'm a qualified coach. So very much um, it's building their self-awareness in a very respectful way um, to just sort of uh, build their under self-understanding around where there might be a pattern of issues for them. Um, and just being very supportive and open with them is what I'd suggest. But that's just from my view. I'm just gonna add to that as well. I think this sort of comes down to making assumptions about people in the workforce generally you know we all operate differently we've all got different sides to our character um, even if we think we're really confident we know something about somebody chances are incorrect so I think this just comes down to generally managing and leading staff having a conversation identifying what someone is skilled at or what someone needs more support in um, and just building that confidence that way but I think it's we definitely cannot assume that somebody you know has something that you know, don't make assumptions about people, I guess it comes down to. Look, and the other thing that uh, we at Job Access um, encourage is that employers focus on 
um, the employees meeting their inherent requirements of their role, regardless of their disability or regardless of what you might assume is a disability. Um, if they're unable to meet their inherent requirements of their role and you perceive it to be due to um, a, a, you know, a disability, then you could have that conversation with them, but you would need to focus on, on what aren't they meeting in their role um, and, and identify those and treat it as a, as a, you know, if it gets to that, but you treat it as a performance management issue at the end of the day. But if it's not affecting their capacity to do their role, then it, it shouldn't um, it shouldn't matter. And of course, you know, that that um, hotline that we have, I saw some questions coming through on the chat. Um, you can utilize that 1-800-464-800 hotline at Job Access to um, get answers around any of these questions that you're answer, um, asking, um, you know, in relation to um, settling back into the office after lockdown for people with a disability or, or um, you know, even in this um, example that I just talked about with um, someone might maybe, um, might have a disability and you're not sure how to how to support them. Uh, Martha is qualifying actually her question. Um, she's not the employer. She's supporting them in securing employment. Um, so it's more from a, a support uh, point of view. Um, Sarah, Sarah, any uh, comments see. you'd like to make about that? Yeah, look, we have um, we have an employer toolkit that's available to anyone, really. Um, I mean, it's it's kind of more aimed at employers, but anyone who's kind of helping someone find work could utilise it as well. It's available on our website. It's it's like a, uh, and I put it in the chat before as well, it's like a one-stop shop on disability recruitment, and it's made up of one to three minute videos on anything you need to know around disability rec uh, recruitment. So, you could certainly utilise that employer toolkit um, and, and get some answers there. It will it'll cover my colleague who's worked in recru uh, recruitment management in, in, for, uh, in a corporate organisation for a number of years. He, um, he combed through that employer toolkit and he said that in his professional opinion, there is not a single thing that we have missed in that employer toolkit that, um, that would be relevant for, to disability recruitment. So feel free to utilise that. I think I put the, uh, the link in the chat room earlier. You did, I can see that there. A um, couple more questions um, from Rhys. Uh, what is the best way to get employers to see the benefits to having an inclusive workplace and, and to, uh, I guess, embrace workplace modifications, uh, to take up workplace modifications? Um, perhaps that's a question for, for you, Jim. Is that a question you'd like to address? Um, yeah, look, uh, again, you know, embracing, it's all about being comfortable, um, showing empathy, understanding. Uh, I think we, we know a lot of those things, you know, not, not, not concentrating or, or not being specific on the things that the person can't do, but maybe on the things that they can do. Uh, I suppose we're in a, a pretty good position where we can break up the roles a little bit better. And um, again, it's it's building those, it's getting the confidence up. They may not have worked for quite some time, so it's a, it's a it's a matter of just building those confidences up. That you know what, it, it's a ten stage cleaning. You know, people may laugh, but it's probably a ten stage process cleaning. And if they can only do one or two initially, well, let's work on those. Let's build those confidences up, and then build on them and. and and build those enthusiasms instead of going, well, you can't really do it. This is probably not the thing, not the place for you. Uh, yeah. Again, it's mm. you know, thanks, it's Jim. The empathy, you know, opportunity, opportunity, opportunity. Um, maybe uh, Sue, do you have a, a response to that question as well about uh, the best way to get employers to see the benefits to having an inclusive workplace? I mean, I understand that as an art gallery, it's you're not necessarily employing the artists, although many of the artists are actually self-employed, um, but yeah. you're working every day uh, with people uh, who have disability in, and who are working in that workplace. What, yeah, look, what, oh, I think it's very simple. Yeah. Show, show people, show people. Yeah. This is what, yeah, the, the, the best way um, that we communicate our inclusive nature of working is by bringing people into the organisation. Obviously, it's been a bit difficult in the last year and a half. Keep having to harp on that. But um, our gallery is a place where our artists feel very comfortable and hang out. Um, we love welcoming people into uh, normally. We love wel welcoming people into our studio space just so they can see what's happening. And it, it can 
flip the mindset of someone in five minutes. They come in with an expectation of, I don't know what they expect to be quite frank, but they don't expect a vibrant creative community who are all working hard and, you know, on working for the same thing. I, I, I still think there's, and it's getting less and less, it is getting less, but I still think there's a broader community misunderstanding about um, what people with disabilities can do and how they can add to an environment, to a work environment. So any opportunity, if you're an employer who is employing people, I'm not saying, you know, come and put that person on a pedestal, just share your workplace as a broader environment and those are part of the stories you can tell and, and that you can show. So we wouldn't have had Leonard Joel pick up the traineeship had they not already understood the culture of our organisation by coming in and being a part of it. So share, share, share. That's what I say. Thanks, I'd, Steve. I'd like to add to that, actually. Um, look, people with a disability bring a range of skills and talents to the, to the workplace. Okay. They have all sorts, of, hold all sorts of jobs, um, a whole range of tertiary and trade qualifications. We had some stats um, that I'd like to share that one million people with a disability are employed across diverse industries and occupations in Australia. 12% uh, of people with a disability who work run their own businesses and 32% of the employees with a disability work as professionals or managers. Um, I think those stats speak for themselves. Um, more than capable of doing a job is just as much as anyone else is. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, I understand that uh, Tamsin's got a hand up, but I just uh, also mentioned that um, for those other employers or other businesses um, in, the, uh, in the audience, if you'd like to contribute an answer to that question or make a contribution, feel free to do so in the chat um, because uh, we'd encourage all of you to participate. Um, Tamsin, you had your hand up. Uh, yeah, um, just responding to Reese's question, adding to what Sue said, um, I know Reese is involved as well in work experience programs where the employers actually get to try, they see what people can do in their workplace and opens their mind. Any sort of work experience, apprenticeships, trials before you were in part of the recruitment, things like that, I think are so valuable. Um, so yeah, thank you for that question. Reese and yeah the Teens Work Know How program at AV has been having a big impact on employer perception. So, thank you. Thank you Tamsin. Now we're running out of time we've only got a couple of minutes left of the allotted time. Um, people are welcome to stay on uh, after the allotted time if they choose to do so. So we might make this the last question uh, before I wrap up. Another question from Reese: um, How do we help young, pe young people with disabilities make a successful transition to open employment after high school? Uh, it's a tricky question. Um, I just uh, make mention of the fact uh, that we have another forum, another of our series of jobs forums coming up in February, uh, which is entirely about young people, uh, about employment for young people. It's not specifically about young people with disabilities, but there's always opportunities to um, to raise similar issues. Um, so that might be better addressed at that particular event. Uh, and we'll be putting out uh, information about that event very shortly before the end of this year. Um, I don't know if anyone in the, um, on the panel would like to answer that question about young people with disabilities. I would recommend that they utilize the disability employment service providers, but I'm not sure, I think Reese might be from there anyway, is that correct? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, Reese is involved in a, a pilot project around work experience and we've been liaising with him. Okay. Um, but it is, it's a key, and it's, this is how we see work experience is one of these things that can help with transition. Um, but it is this major change, especially for our autistics, uh, to understand work um, and the transition sports need are quite specialist. So that's where I think that's coming from. Thank you. Now we're just about to run out of time. Uh, I know there is another question there about social procurement. I might just put that to one side for now, uh, because I want to say thank you to everyone, uh, particularly our panel members, um, our special guests, um, to uh, wonderful Wurundjeri elder, Uncle Tony Garvey, um, to Chelsea and to Therese for the wonderful job that they've been doing as Auslan interpreters here today. 
Um, and I'd also like to thank my colleagues, um, Jade, uh, for doing a great job of facilitating the panel discussion. And in the background, um, team members, Skylar, Megan, and uh, Glenn, who've been invaluable in putting this together. Um, thank you everyone for coming along and sharing. Um, many of you have shared your contact details in the chat room. Um, we always like to do this because it encourages people to network beyond these events. So we do have those that information and we can make that available to everybody else. If you object to that, if you really don't want your contact details being shared, could you please let us know? Um, otherwise, if you have put contact details in that chat, we will be sharing those. Um, some feedback coming through, fantastic forum, very informative. So once again, thank you very much. The question about social procurement just before we go, um, I actually would throw that open um, to the participants here today. Perhaps that's a question you'd all like to ponder, um, how you can make social procurement and the activities that are driven by that business as usual. I think that's a question many of us would like to have answered, um, particularly myself in my role. There's a few things coming up on the screen right now as we close off, and there will be a survey that will be sent to everyone on the closing of this event. Um, and I'd encourage you all to complete that survey and give us your feedback. But for now, thank you very much. Stay safe, everyone. Go well. Thank you and have a great day.